All right, so I need everybody to get in groups of two to three people, all right? I'm going to give you a series of four back-to-back -back quizzes that are intended to measure your psychological health and discernment, okay? Are we ready? So I need you to bunch in, groups of two to three. Uh, I'm Brian Jones, by the way, pastor here at the church. Welcome. Um, uh, let's go ahead and let's jump in. First quiz is this. Test number one. Which is the correct way to cook a marshmallow when you're making s'mores? Okay, you know what s'mores are? Yeah, come on, this is, everyone should know what s'mores are, right? I have provided a picture that will help you, okay? Here's the picture. I want you to get together as a group and you're going to decide which number is the right number. Okay, raise your hand if you believe the right way to cook a marshmallow is somewhere between one and six. Okay, we got a few, okay. Uh, basically, this means you're a people pleaser. You're not willing to go all in. Uh, raise your hand if you picked uh, eight, nine, or 10. Raise your hand, okay. Basically, this means that you have a dark, empty soul. <laughs> Who makes a marshmallow like that? Obviously, the correct answer is seven. Seven. Who said seven? Yes. Yes. That is the perfect number in the Bible, and that's the way our Lord made them in Galilee. Here we go. <laughs> Test number two. What color is the shirt I'm wearing? Get in your groups. Okay. Now, um, raise your hand if you think it's salmon. Raise your hand if you think it's yellow or orange. Okay, now I just want to say, you remember a few years ago, there was that blue dress illusion? It, it plays tricks on your eyes, and this is one of those situations where the, the shirt and the, and the light, everything, is playing a trick on your eyes. Okay, so if you picked um, yellow or orange, you have a high probability of being a serial killer. Um, if you pick salmon, that just means, like Jesus, you like to sit close to the front and you're not looking through the, the, the projector. There we go. Okay. Third one. Which staff member is going to age the best? Okay. I think you know where I'm going with this. I want you to be honest and loving and kind. Now, this past week, social media was filled with pictures of people who used a face app to age themselves with the help of AI to project out 30 years into the future. Have you seen this app? Basically, you snap a picture of yourself, and then the AI feature automatically ages you 30 years, and then the Russians have all of your personal information. So, so here's the test. Um, I'm going to show you four staff members, including me, and I want you to decide who like fine wine is going, is going to age the best. Here we go. Here's the first one. This is Frank Chaparino in 2019. All right? This is Frank Chaparino in 2049. <laughs> Not bad, right? But hey, you know what? He's already bald, okay? So that's not fair at all. Uh, here's Dan Reichel in 2019. Here's Dan Reichel with 16 cups of coffee a day for 30 years. <laughs> Um, all right, the next staff member here is Eric Sumter in 2019. All right, uh, here is Eric Sumter headlining the Copacabana 30 years from now. All right, so you sure, you don't want to see pictures of me, do you? No, no you don't. Okay, so, so here's a picture that Sumter took of me outside Kumo, Japanese, uh, uh, last year. Uh, and then they had this feature where you could add a hipster beard. And so here I am with a hipster beard. Can I pull that off? Okay, all right. So here, so they also had a feature where you could put bangs on you. So tell me, can I pull that off? No? I can do the beard, but I can't. No bangs? No bangs. It would take a miracle, actually, to have those kinds of bangs. Okay, so do you really want to see a picture of me 30 years from now? 
Okay, here it is. Right there. So, all right. So, like fine wine, who's going to age the best, right? Okay. Test number four, and this is more personal, in 30 years, spiritually speaking, will you be more committed or less committed? Okay? Now, I want you to actually get with your group, and I, the answer that I want you to give, 30 years from now, am I going to be more committed spiritually, less committed spiritually, or about the same? Go. I'm going to give you about 15 seconds. All right, raise your hand. I'm actually not even going to have you raise your hands. Statistically speaking, across the board, if you are like most people, 30 years from now, you are going to be much less committed in your faith than you are right now. Um, a number of years ago, my family and I went to the Effort of Cloister. Have you ever been to this place? It's outside Hershey. Uh, it, it, was, uh, it was a... Uh, a commune uh, that was established by a German wandering mystic uh, by the name of Conrad Beisler. Came from Germany, here to the United States, and founded a church, but it wasn't just a church. It was more like a commune, like a Protestant monastery. And uh, they, their heyday was in 1750-ish. They made their own wine and booklets and they, they were celibate, so the church didn't last very long. They were, they were celibate, meaning they never got married. Um, they lived in this crazy monastic fashion. They wore these white outfits. Uh, this is a reenactment of the effort of cloister. Our family did this tour where they showed us that they woke up in the morning at 5 a.m. to pray. And then after prayer, they worked until 9 in the morning. And then at 9 in the morning, they stopped to do what? What do you think they did? They stopped to pray. And then they worked until noon, and then they stopped to do what? They prayed. They only ate one meal. It was in the evening. Then they worked until 5, and then they stopped. And what do you think they did then? Nope, they didn't, pr they didn't uh, pray. They played soccer, actually. They had amazing foot skills. <laughs> amazing, sorry. Yes, of course, they prayed. They prayed, and then they had dinner, and then after dinner, they had classes in the evening, and then they went to bed at 9 p.m., and they slept on, honestly, you can see in this picture here, blocks of wood. They slept literally on these square blocks of wood. You think you have neck problems or sleep problems or back problems, be glad you weren't a part of the effort of cloister. And then at 2 a.m. in the morning, they all woke up to do what? To pray and wait for Jesus to come back. Now, it's going to shock you, but the effort of cloister did not last very long, right? And uh, how long do you think it took for their commitment to fizzle out? About 30 years. Conrad Beeser died, and within about 30 years, it just turned into a regular church. So I want you to write down on a piece of paper or in your mind this statement. It's a universal principle. What goes up must come down. Spiritually speaking, unless you become intentional about your spiritual growth and development, there's something about that 30-year mark where you just fizzle away. And so what is your life going to look like 30 years from now? And because that's what we're all looking at, right? We're all looking long-term over a long arc of our lives. We're not looking how we can just get a quick spurt of spiritual growth. We're not looking how we can be, just be a better person for two years. We have to be thinking in long arcs. And the fact of the matter is, the tragic fact of the matter is, it's human nature and a part of our culture to go down, down, down. Jesus died, the church exploded. Acts chapter 2, it says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day 
They continued to meet together in the temple court. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere heart, praising God and enjoying the favor of all of the people. And the Lord added their number daily, those who were being saved, and the church exploded all throughout the Mediterranean world. And then, about 30 years later, there was a book in the New Testament called the Book of Hebrews. It doesn't have a name attached to it. We don't know who wrote it. Either one of two things happened. It was just the Apostle Paul's book, or it could have been Priscilla. It could have been a, a woman who basically wrote the book that was a leader in the early church, basically who felt that her book wouldn't get the authority if she put a name on it as a common thing in history. We don't know who wrote the book, but it was included in the New Testament canon, and Hebrew chapter 10, verse 24 said, 30 years after the church exploded, they're having to tell people, let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together. I just want to let, you have, let that sink in for a moment. These people had a group around them, so much so that they enjoyed it so deeply that they were doing it every single day of their lives, every single day. Nothing was too hard for them. They were all willing to die, and many of them did. But 30 years later, they're like, i got to be honest, I'm watching Joel Osteen on TV. I'm not going to church today. I'm just not going to do it. So here's my question. How are you going to be different? And this is just a matter of going to church. This is about, let's say, you know, we had a camp. With, presumably, there are a number of people that are here that have been blessed with kids. It's about you living the kind of life that is an example for your kids for the next 30 years. Because we think the most important is like that. Wherever they are right now, that's the most important. And I can tell you, after they leave their house, it doesn't get any less important. The stakes just get bigger. So why is it that we can be so on fire one minute and the next minute we're like, eh, yeah. Why is it we can have so many people here one Sunday at CCB, and the next Sunday it's like, eh. Or you, at kids' camp, you feel like it's heaven and on earth, and now all you can do is muster up the, eh, to go to church. It's human nature. It's a part of our culture. As, as disciples of Jesus, we also believe that the evil one is involved in that. And so I've been thinking about praying about this, and I remembered this old theory from economics class. It's called the sigmoid curve. Economists use the sigmoid curve basically as a way to help people understand movements uh, within organizations. And basically at some point, every movement starts, and then it flounders a bit, and at that point it either dies or it takes off. Every idea or movement will die at a low point or it's going to take off. You, personally... Your walk with Christ as a disciple of Jesus, it will start out, yeah, and it will peter a little bit. And at that point, at that low point, you have a decision to make. Am I really going to do this even when it's hard? Am I going to do this when I'm uncomfortable? Am I going to do this when it costs me something? Can I see 30 years out the long-term benefit of having my character slowly transformed not just for my benefit, but for the, for the benefit of the people that I'm close to. Yeah, here, so the problem is you just can't sustain energy indefinitely because what goes up must come down. Remember Krispy Kreme when no one heard of Krispy Kremes? Remember that? Was anybody around when Krispy Kremes weren't Krispy Kremes? Like, what are we doing? Oh, we're getting Krispy Kremes. We're on vacation. We're getting Krispy Kremes, 11 o'clock at night. What are we doing? We're getting Krispy Kremes. I just remember when there wasn't even a Krispy Kreme. There was a Krispy Kreme, but no one knew it as Krispy Kreme. And then there was the massive Krispy Kreme phase. Now who goes to Krispy Kremes anymore? Raise your hand. Something wrong with you. And you, and you, and you, right? Starbucks. No one ever heard of this little company in Seattle called Starbucks. And then, bam, it took off, and then it went down. Did it go back up? It could. What goes up must come down. Same thing happens with Christians. We explore spiritual matters. We flounder a little bit. 
bam, we get baptized, we explode with enthusiasm, and after a while, energy dies down. But the theory of the sigmoid curve basically says that the secret to constant growth is to start a new curve before the first one peters out. The right place to start that second curve is at point A, not when you've lost all desire and energy and I literally don't even know if I believe in God anymore. It's at that first point at point A, when you have the momentum, when you have the energy, when you can see yourself doing this 30 years from now, but in your heart of hearts you're thinking, I'm ready for something new. God says in Isaiah, behold, I am doing a new thing, says the Lord. Do you not see it? Those who have ears to hear, those who have eyes to see, let them see what's going on. The point is, is you can grow, and history has shown that lots of people over a 30-year span of time can become more committed, more holy, more loving, more gracious, in the game all the way until the end. The Apostle Paul says in Romans 12, 11, never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Never be lacking in zeal. What's the enemy of spiritual growth? What's the enemy of starting again? Philippians chapter 3, the Apostle Paul says, whatever were gains to me in this life, whatever is awesome about this life, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage. What's he considering garbage? Homes, cars, money, vacation. Now you have to look at that in context. Obviously, these are good things. You've got to have, to, you got to have a car to drive around. You've got to have a house to live in. There's absolutely nothing wrong with vacations. But if they're the kinds of things in our lives that are going to take us down and down and down, one vacation turns into four excursions, turns into every single weekend this fall where I need to get away and I need to re be rejuvenated. And I, it's all, you know, and then spiritually you, you're at Christmas time and you've just done this deep dive. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. If it's three months, three years, or 30 years from now, I'm pressing on. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and starting a new sigmoid curve and straining towards what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heaven, heavenward in Christ Jesus. And so today's kickoff, or today's message is a kickoff for a series we're calling The Hole You Cannot Fill. If I was to describe the 422 corridor, it would be a bunch of really nice, really wonderful people who have a massive gaping hole in their soul where they're trying to fill that hole with stuff, with things other than God. It's going to be a series about that. The philosopher Blaise Pascal said that inside of us we have what, is, what he calls the infinite abyss. Meaning if it was a hole that was like 30 feet long, we could find something that was 30 feet long and stick it in that hole. But this abyss that's inside of us is infinite and what do we, how do we fill that hole to provide meaning in our lives? A lot of people in this area will do it with kids. Their entire life revolves around their kids. Kids activities, sports activities, swimming activities, band activities, lacrosse, soccer, tournaments, this ribbon, that trophy, that scholarship. Sports and kids' activities have become an idol. 
And when we try to fill our lives, and more importantly, their lives, with that idol, without realizing the 30-year long-term trajectory here, very bad things happen. People try to fill that hole with work. This job didn't work. I'm going to go to that job. I'm going to go to that job. I'm going to go to... You know what work is called? Work. You know why it's called work? Because it's work. When did work become this therapeutic thing to basically fill a hole in our lives? Should you do something that is a fit for you? Yes. Should you avoid work that is hard? Of course not. Here's one thing that people in this area, in the 422, uh, they fill, try to fill the hole with relaxation. Okay. I have two questions for you. Number one. For the love of God, can you please stop taking pictures of your feet at the beach? Can we do that? Can we make an agreement? Can we all on behalf of the 17% 17 people, 17 of people on the planet who are creeped out by feet, can we stop doing this? Can I get an amen? Can I get an amen? Bless you. Bless you. Yes. Let's stop that. But number two, am I the only person in the world who hates going to the beach? Okay, raise your hand if you hate going to the beach. Okay, there's some of us here. Okay, so we're at Virginia Beach. Uh, 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 what, some weekend, at the end, uh, Memorial Day weekend, in May. And so our daughter's there, Lisa's there, and we got the whole car ready, and we go out to the beach, and we get onto the beach, and then we get the chairs, and then we've got the, the what's the thing you get under, and we got one of those things, and that we're positioned right, and then we've got um, um, uh, water, and then someone behind us is playing really bad 80s music, and then we're, we're slathering the stuff on us, and I sit down, and after everyone has done all of that, we sit down, I say, Lisa, are we doing it now? Is this it? We're doing it. I'm like, we are doing it. We are doing it. We're at the beach. I'm like, what are we going to do for the next six hours? She's like, you're going to sit there. Maybe read a book. Maybe go in the water and get back. I said, this is, let me, this is like my, my favorite people in the least favorite activity ever. I'm literally, I have oil all over me. There is sand getting in places where sand should not go. I'm like, what is this? Anyway, but people we'll take relaxation to an extreme and try to fill that hole, won't we? Now, you may not be a beach person. I'm a mountain person. I go to the mountains every week. And we just have developed this lifestyle that, you know, something down deep inside of me is going to get filled if I just find that place where I can go. You know, other things that we do, we try to fill that hole in our lives by creating and crafting bodies that people will admire. We work out, we eat, and we love the attention. Now, there's nothing wrong with being in shape. People ask me if I'm a model all the time. There's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> but if you're trying to fill a hole, how many really, really jacked or really, really beautiful people that they work at it do you know who are genuinely unhappy. Bucket lists. People in this culture create bucket lists. I follow this family on Instagram called The Bucket List Family. Do you follow The Bucket List Family? I gotta tell you, about three days out of seven, I'm like, I wanna live their life. Because they're constantly going to these amazing places around the world. Absolutely beautiful experiences. I love to travel. I would love to be the bucket, fam bucket list family three out of seven days of the week. The other four days of the week, I know what every theologian, every psychologist, <laughs> every, every sociologist, every social worker could possibly tell us is that this is absolutely the worst possible thing you could do for a person's spiritual growth is constantly moving around all over the world. Not having rootedness, not having community. I, trust me, I want to live the bucket list. And all of us are constantly trying to fill this hole with stuff. 
problem is there's nothing in this world that will fill this hole. And that's what this series is about. God, we just pray that as we come back next week, as we continue to engage in the passages that we're looking at, we pray that you would flip our culture's understanding of the good life upside down. We pray that you would give us fresh eyes and new eyes to see the possibilities of what you can do in our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for watching today's message. Make sure to check out Brian's new book, Finding Favor, God's Blessings Beyond Health, Wealth, and Happiness. To sign up for Brian's newsletter, please go to Brian's website at brianjones.com.